Well, we got Gary and Jones here. Fresh new author. What up? What up? Fresh what new up? husband. <laughs> yeah. How's the married life going? You know what? I I love I love being married because it's like the most difficult and uh, fulfilling, beautiful thing that I've ever been uh, associated with. And I, I don't plan on leaving. And it's just the reason why it's so beautiful because you grow so much in ways that you wouldn't typically grow because the your your woman or if you you're in another relationship, I mean, your woman or your man can see things in you that you can't see in yourself, and because it's so close to home, it's like damn, it it's it's a constant level up with me and my wife. So I am grateful for for our marriage. Amazing, yeah. And how's how's it feel being an author now? Man, I could write a book on the process of how to write a book because I went through everything that you could possibly think of and then finally it it came out. So it's such a gratifying feeling like climbing this mountain that you weren't getting anywhere and then all of a sudden you started gaining traction but you climbed for two hours and realized that it was only a millimeter ahead and then finally you start gaining traction. Then you get to the top of the mountain. Then the book is launched. Now you're exposed. Oh yep. man, there's no turning back now because it's like out there, right? Yeah. Now take me through the process of this book because didn't you hire a ghostwriter and Yo, then you just couldn't even deal with that anymore? I went through everything. I hired a ghostwriter, paid all this money, and then it was a finished product. However, it wasn't a finished product that sounded anything like me. And there's like no disrespect. It's just. I'm known for being this person that just say it how it is and just put yourself out there. And I was reading it. I'm like, yo, I don't even talk like this, like at all. And I went back to the drawing board and then I hired a developmental editor and then it just didn't work. And then hired this person to do it, then hired another ghostwriter. I'm like, I don't know how people do this because I what I was told is a lot of a lot of authors do it and I just couldn't do it. And then finally one day I had a finished product, but I feel like I was like, I feel like something is missing. And that's when it hit me. One of the biggest uh, um, components to my transformational change was uh, just the fact that my, my relationship with God, just the spiritual context of how I live my life, but of course translated in my own way, wasn't anywhere in the book. I was trying to please every human without honoring my own mm -hmm. truth. And I was like, wait a second, this is my book. And so once I took my power back and started writing from the spirit, all of a sudden the what what was woven through all the pages is my relationship with God, but it, it, I wasn't trying to cookie cutter it. I was just putting it out the way that it is. You know, I love trap music, but I also love classical music, but I also go to church and I also pray every single night. And you're going to get that from the book. It's just like, man, this dude is, I love the way that he displays his authenticity. So that was the process of the book. Absolutely. And I was telling everyone, this is the most, this book is the most excited I've been for a book in a long time. Really? Why? So it all started when we met at the Penthouse Mastermind. Okay. And I heard your story, which we'll get into in a second. Your okay. story is the craziest story I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> but then when we first linked up outside of there at your house, mm -hmm. we had the six and a half hour conversation. Wow. Yeah, that's yeah. right. It's crazy. And I go, man, this guy has some major depth to him. Where's his book? Right. And then you didn't have a book, but you said you were writing it at the time. Yeah. So I'm like, we only had six and a half hours to talk. And that's so funny because most people I'll be like, okay, we had a two hour conversation. That's crazy. We had a six and a half hour conversation and we had to leave because we had things to do. We could yeah. have kept talking. Oh, abs all day long. All day long. And then we were just giving and receiving and receiving and giving like all day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly why I was excited for this. Whoever did this cover art is is an incredible There's artist. A, right it's here. a guy named Ark Nair. Um, and, um, Indian guy. And he was just like, you know, I've got to pray. And he was doing his, he was just such an in interesting character. However, he's the one of the few people in artistry that truly gets my soul. And we were going back and forth and back and forth. 
And I was like, you know what? I want, this is what I really want. I want a cover that somebody looks at it and it tells the entire journey of my transformation and their journey without me having to explain it at all. And a lot of book covers have the title explaining about the book. And I wanted something that was so vi like it literally challenges your mind to think, what is that? And I, and then we got to the point where it was like, man, but that I, if I put a title on it, it'll take away from what I wanted to create. And I was like, nah, I don't typically see a book with no title. That's why I'm going to make a book with no title and then put the title on the back. But it was crazy, man. Now, did you originally plan on putting your name right here? Or was it just going to be completely blank? Well, I wanted to put the name there. Um, yeah, no, I, wa I always wanted to put the name there. And, um, but it just, I just wanted to have the, you know, the, I wanted to have the, just that art right there. Cause I'm a, I'm a visual artist. I love to paint. I love to watercolor, draw and things like that. And it just, uh, just to respect the art. I didn't want to put anything on that. So that was like its foundation. Garen's the foundation of the art that was created. Yeah, absolutely. So speaking of foundation, yeah, for those of them who are watching this and don't know your story, yeah, it all starts in Houston. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm, Missouri City. What was it called? Missouri City. It's a subdivision that's like right outside of Houston. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay, I never knew that. Yeah. Because I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. Okay, got it. You know, um, so the, the, the founders or the owners of St. Louis, Missouri wanted to create the land of sunshine and... I'm paraphrasing, phrasing, this is like Google, but then they wanted to create the land of sunshine. And so they brought Missouri, like Missouri city over to, to there. And it was going to be this land of sunshine. So it was selling people on the sunshine. Yo, they said when they sold everybody and got them all to move to, to Missouri city, mm. it was like raining, like cats and dogs, like crazy. No sunshine at all. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, so my story. So your story, yeah, it was it was a very rough start, yeah, and it went it was kind of like this up and down, up and down, up and down. Absolutely, I'd love for you to give me some details on that. So, um, <clears throat> well, I was born in Houston, raised in Missouri City. Uh, my mother was always at work. At the time, my brother was too cool to to hang hang out with me. We're really good friends now, but but at the time, I was just like this person that was by himself. I would always get in trouble. I got kicked out of school every single year. Was um, I had to go to alternative school. When I wasn't at alternative school, I was at, um, um, what is it called? Juvenile for breaking into cars, breaking into houses. And the people that I hung out with, it, you know, and this is really important. I want, want people to, to, to really grasp this. I never set out to hurt anyone. I was a loner. And then people took me in. The people, the only, only people who took me in were the kids who were up to no good and doing crazy things out in the world and breaking into cars. I naturally was doing what my surroundings were doing just by nature. And I was like, oh man, this person that I respect is doing this. They're making money. Well, then I'm going to do this and I'm going to make some money too. Well, I just kept doing that and I never stopped so and what year was this so this was i was breaking into the the neighborhood uh recreation center stealing candy and blow pops and selling them for for a dollar and doing all these different things uh in the eighth grade so seventh and eighth grade because i asked my mom for these 150 dollar michael jordans she was like well when you can make your own money and something just mm. just lit a fire in me when you can make your own money you can buy whatever you want so i did whatever i needed to do to to um make the money and i made the money in two days it took me two days to sell blow pops for four dollar bubble gum uh those large pixie sticks snickers and everything at school got the patent leather um uh patent leather white and baby blue jordans and I made the money. Where'd you get that from? You said when I can make the money. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But that taught me something. When I want something, 
I got to work really hard to go get it. So my mom inadvertently taught me how to hustle because she wouldn't give me anything because most of my clothes came from garage sales and everything. And so just going through that, running with the running in the streets with the, you know, with the rougher kids and everything, that was my upbringing. That was my domestication. Now, if you take a, if you know how ABCs work, so the, the, the first forming of language, ABCs turns into words, turns into sentences, paragraphs, essays, books, libraries. So imagine the ABCs of growing up in a rough environment and then you keep doing it. That's going to continuously keep expanding. So my domestication was get in trouble, do whatever you got to do to get what you want, which is I never not got what I want. I got everything I wanted, whether I was cutting lawns, um, uh, washing cars, lemonade stand, uh, breaking in the houses, breaking in the cars. I never thought about what it was. It's do whatever you need to do to get what you want. That was my foundation of coming up. So this was in 1994. Would that does it sound right? <laughs> it's around around about that time, yeah. Because a lot of people look at you and not believe. Well, I'm 40 years you're old. You're 40 years old. Yeah, they're exactly. probably like, "What are you talking about?" No, I'm 40 years old. I'll be 41 in July. Incredible. And, yeah. And you said when you had that major mind shift. Yeah. That's coming up in a bit. Yeah. That's when you literally like. Reverse your age. You said people are coming up to you and you're like, what did you do to your face? You oh, absolutely. My, my own daughter said, did you get plastic surgery? I'm like, hell no. Nah. <laughs> like, not, but that, that I we'll, we'll get into it. But it, that a 105 year old person said, age don't make you old. It's when you let your life beat you down and you, you have resentment towards people and you don't forgive people and things like that, that when you're in a job that you don't like and you stay there, when you're in a relationship that you don't love and you stay there, that weighs down your soul and your spirit starts to say your spirit can't hold that weight. So when I start to let go of all that stuff, it's almost like my life, my natural born life started to actually live rather than weigh itself down. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So you kind of get introduced this life around the eighth grade yeah and then take me through your high school years what did you how were you in high school it was the same thing same thing like i never it 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 was as if abc's goes into words so my abc version was breaking into cars that was my introduction so imagine i'm still doing the same things but now my friends are starting to get put in prison and now in high school my friends are starting to die and now there's more drugs being involved. I, I probably smoked weed one time and never had a sip of alcohol. So that part never got me. Everything else did. And um, so in high school, I was just, I, I still always felt alone. And I didn't start puberty till I was 18 years old. So I didn't get any girls. And so all the cutest girls I would, I would, muster enough energy to ask them out. They're like, oh, you're like my little brother. Oh. And so I got the little brother syndrome. Now I'm six foot one. And so funny, a lot of them came back. It was like, wow, you grew up to be, nope, too late, too late, <laughs> too late. Don't, don't, don't come back now. You made me feel shitty when I was a little kid. Oh yeah, I know exactly what you're talking yeah. about. So you get through high school. Yeah. And this is a part that's still confusing to me. I yep. know you start professionally modeling. Yeah. Was that around the end of high school, like 18, 19? So that's, so when I came out and I went to Los Angeles, that's when I started modeling. Was that right after so high school? I was 18, yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. And how did that happen? Because you don't really talk about that part too much. So that's because I never have enough time in any interview. <laughs> that just, so basically, I'm one of those people, if I say... I might be interested in something and then some one, all it takes is one person to doubt me or not believe in me. And then that fire just, but the same fire that had the little kid go and break into the rec center and take all of this candy to get the shoes that he wanted is the same fire when people doubt me and say that I can't do something. So someone, 
I said, I think, you know, someone said, oh, you're really cute. You, you should like try and model or something like that. And then their friend goes, you'd never make it as a model. You're too short. Damn. So then <laughs> I looked up every single agency and I put all the easy ones first. I put the most difficult ones last, and which was uh, Ford and Wilhelmina. And then over a four day period, I didn't have a car. I was five foot nine. The going rate for a mo- for a model six foot one and above. So nothing was going in my favor. And, and this was in 2000 to, uh, it was 1999, 2000 during that time in high fashion, you didn't have a lot of African American, uh, models. You just had Boris Kojo and, and Tyson Beckford. That was it. And everybody else was a completely different color. Uh, nationality as well. Um, not nationality, but completely different color. Right. Um, so in 2000, it was a lot, not a lot of black models. You got them in maybe a couple commercials, maybe in some music videos on BET and things like that. But in 2000, it wasn't as variety, you know, as, as it is now. So I was black trying to do high fashion too short, no abs, no model clothes, no car, no Z cards, no portfolio. And I went to 12 different agencies and I got rejected, 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 rejected. We already have somebody that looks like you. And they would literally give me up maybe one minute because there was a, it was a cattle call. Yeah. So all these models would come in and everybody was like, and I would just get rejected. I'm like, dang. And then halfway on the second day, I'm like, why am I, this is stupid. Why am I doing this? And a little voice inside goes, you've come this far, keep going. And so I would keep going next day, rejected, rejected, rejected. Next day I get to Ford and it, it and this is Ford Models. This is like the top agency. Rejection. We already have somebody that looks like you. Wilhelmina. They got David Beckham. They got Beyonce. They got all these people, right? So I get there. There was like 60 guys in there, and they all looked perfect. They were like 6'3", sweater abs. They looked like David Beckham in every race. It was the craziest thing. And I'm like, I don't look like anybody here. And that was my insecurity. I don't look like anybody here. So then halfway through as everybody, because I was one of the last people in, everybody's getting rejected. Halfway through, I'm watching myself say, this, this, is, this is so stupid. I go and leave. Little voice comes back. You've come this far. Keep going. Finally, it gets down to the last person. And I'm getting ready to turn at, turn away again. I'm like, this guy is on all these, because uh, it was models from other agencies in there because they wanted to get with the top agency. This guy is on all of these billboards and he just got rejected. I'm not going to make it. So all of a sudden, it comes to me, this little short guy named David Todd, he looks at me and he goes, hmm. We'd love to represent you. Oh. And I was like, wait, wait. And I didn't even know what to do. I was like numb with emotions. I didn't know what to do with myself. And I just stayed calm because in my head, I'm like, I don't look like nobody. And guess what he said? We'd love to represent you. You don't look like any of our models. Oh, amazing. And I was like, whoa, sent me on three auditions, sent me on a destiny's child, jump and jump video. <laughs> which paid 4,000. Mind you, I had no money, which paid $4,000. Buckles campaign, uh, uh, the Buckle campaign, which paid 2,500. And um, Skechers campaign, which paid 3,000. Bro, I booked all three of them that day. So you went from like no money to making $10,000 like yes. right away. Yes, and here's, here's what's even crazier. I didn't even get to make it to the de- uh, jump in j- the Destiny's Child uh, audition because I, did, I was on a bus, so I didn't make it the time. I woke up the next morning, and my agent would go, said to me, congratulations, you booked all three jobs. I'm like, even the Destiny's Child? Because I didn't <laughs> tell him. I'm like, yo, I didn't want to tell him I didn't make it. I was like, even the Destiny's Child? He said, yeah. Beyonce was with the agency. 
She just happened to walk into the agency and hand picked my card off the wall and said, I want him to be my love interest. And I was her love interest in the uh, Destiny's Child Jumpin' Jumpin' video. Wow. Yeah, bro. Wow. Like Beyonce that. herself. Beyonce herself handpicked my card off the wall. Unbelievable. Yeah. Luckily, you listened to that little voice. Yeah. You were literally, like, imagine how different your life would be if you didn't listen to that little voice and you just kept going. Oh, absolutely. Now, here's the lesson that I want everybody to get. Not the fact that I, I got this big gig and I, I made the $10,000. Notice the mindset of the person who kept going past all of the reje rejections. It was... 12 reje 11 rejections and a lot of time and patience in between before I got to the powerful yes. So you grow through your nose to earn your powerful yes. Most people quit after the first or second deal in retail or in anything after the, the girl rejects you. Keep following up. Keep coming back. Keep coming back. And, and I, I'm a firm believer that Life cannot deny someone who gives their absolute all. Like if you show up and you keep showing up, you keep showing up, eventually it, that door is going to open for you. And yeah, and I see that feature in so many very successful people. Like the yeah. Starbucks CEO denied 280 times. Even my friend Elixir, we were in Beverly Hills shooting a video. And have you heard of producer Michael? His name is producer Michael? Yeah, he goes by that on YouTube. Okay, nah. So he ran up and he asked him for a ride. And he's like, no. And he's like, no. And he's like, why not? No. And then he drove away and we saw him again. He ran up for another ride. He's like, come on, how about that ride now? He's like, all right, how about you get in? And what I really got from that is most people wouldn't even ask one time. And right. he went up and asked twice. And it was the second time that actually got him what he wanted in this amazing scene that he would have never gotten if he would have just gave up after the first one. Right. Yeah. No, I'm, listen, I've taken that in every genre of my life. Keep coming back. Keep coming. If you really, really, really believe in something then rejection should not stop you. Never. Yeah. So everything's going super well for you right now. Yeah, everything's going well. I'm living a high life. I'm making money that I've never made before. Have no mentors, no one to teach me about money. So it's just as fast as it's coming in. It's like I have a hole in my bank account. It's just as fast as it's going out. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I hear you even got to the point where you were on in like Times Square. Oh yeah, no, I had a billboard in Times Square. Um, I was in, I was in uh, just these magazines. I, I was doing all kind of campaigns. It was that one time in 2001, if you walked into the mall, I was in seven different stores at one time. Oh my God. Skechers, The Buckle, Wilson's Leather. Um, what else was there? There was, just, but it was like Macy's, JC Penney. They were all in one mall at one time. Plus I had two music videos, two national commercials. It was, uh, old Navy and, um, L'Oreal hair. It, it was clearly something was happening. And I didn't know at that time that it was what I was feeding my mind. I was reading a book called, uh, the power of of positive thinking by Norman Vincent Peale. And I was applying everything that was in the book. And it's a very simple read. And I just kept reading it. I, at that time, I wasn't aware of just how powerful the mind and your attitude and approach to life and the stories that you tell yourself internally. I didn't know how powerful that was, nor how it could uh, uh, manifest the things, the physical equivalent in your life. Okay. So at this point, everything's going amazing. Yeah. Spend making lots of money. Yeah. Spending lots of money. Yeah. And you somehow end up in France. Yeah. How did, how did you end up in France? I met a girl in New York. She was uh, Miss France. Her name is Sonia Rowland. Mm. Miss France 2001. I met her at a, at a New York party. We hit it off immediately. She became my girlfriend. Went to go chase her and you know what I'm saying? I went to France to go be with my girlfriend, stayed with her. She went out of town. Um, when she went out of town, I ended up going to, I think it's like Club Pink or I, I don't remember what it was, but it was Club something. And see, when you're in a foreign country that speaks a language that you don't speak and you encounter somebody who speaks English or your language all of a sudden, the communication goes 10 levels high. 
I was in a club and I saw some people just saw, and I even spoke to, I saw some people in the club that I knew that I knew of from LA and they weren't, they weren't the, like the night I knew that they were up to no good. I knew that they were drug dealers. I knew, I knew what they were about. However, their lifestyle, the girls, the, 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 the tables at the club, the cars, the money. I've always wanted that. I've always wanted that. And so instantly I just walked up and I was like, yo man, I'm, I'm from Los Angeles. I've seen you at this club and everything. And we just instantly hit it off. They're like, what are you doing out here? And you know, I'm out here on business and everything. And all of a sudden one thing led to another. And I, I'm, I've always asked people, how can I get what you have since, since I was little? How can I do that? How can I, it's just that, that I've always asked questions and I was like, how can I live a life like you guys? I, and I see you have like the girls and the cars and everything. What do y'all do? And that's when the opportunity to do something was presented. And that opportunity was me driving a car over a border, getting 4,000 uh, pounds, the, 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 the UK pound, the European pound at that time was two point, was the equivalent of 2.1 US dollar. So like eight thousand dollars, eight thousand dollars a drive. And how long did that drive usually take? It was a full day. So I would fly into the country, drive this uh, luxury vehicle from from uh, from the UK to the ferry, over the ferry into Rotterdam, drop the car off, grab my package, done. I don't, I didn't ask what it was. I knew that it was up to no good. I just didn't quite know exactly what it was. And so I was like, yo, so, and this is while everything was going great in modeling. I had billboards, magazines and everything. However, I'd never had that quick of money. I do a modeling job. I don't get paid for like another three months, four months or something like that. And, and even though I was making six figures, I was just like, yo, I just made four eight thousand dollars in a day. That was quick. What if I did this like five times? Boom, that's quick. And so that's instant cash. I never had that. And I never thought about the repercussions. I've I've been like this since since I was a little kid. Find a way to make money and then you just do whatever you need to do to get it. I even dove when I was a little kid, I dove in Alligator Island, which was a man made lake infested with alligators yeah to go and get golf balls and if you got caught in the lake you'll get like you'd get fined so i'd have a trash bag there like a trash bag was floating i would swim down to the bottom of the lake get the golf balls you know there was because i could sell them four for a dollar to the um to the uh the the golfers and they'll buy them just polish them off sell them four for a dollar no one else went into that lake. So I would go into the places that most people wouldn't go and it was infested with golf balls and alligators. I would get them, never got touched with the alligator, but also didn't go in there with fear. I didn't never think about the repercussion. I wouldn't do that now, (laughs) but I didn't think about the repercussion. Same mentality. I'm going to do whatever I need to do, not thinking about the repercussion, Driving this car, I did that seven times. I did the route seven times. So that's 8,000, 8,000. And this is over a two-month time span. 8,000, 8,000, 8,000, 8,000, 8,000. Cash, tax-free. And I'm like, yo, this is the lick. (laughs) This is the lick until I got caught. And tell me exactly how that happened. Because that's, that's why I remember you mentioned you just had bad feelings the entire day. Your intuition was just yeah. going off. So this time they had, I was, they, they changed the route. So this time the route was going into France. And I was like, man, there's something about this don't feel right. But Wait, where was it going before that? To the UK. To oh, the UK, okay. From the UK to Rotterdam. Okay. Yeah. But I just met the people in France, mm-hmm. you know? So um, from the UK to Rotterdam, every single time, UK, Rotterdam, UK, Rotterdam, UK, Rotterdam. And then when I went to France, I was like, man, something about this just don't feel right. The car didn't feel right. 
I get to uh, I get to this like little stop, <clears throat> and the instructions was to come out, open up the back, and I'd never got those instructions before. I'm like, why open up the back, close it, and then get in and drive? I'm like, something about that don't feel right. It's just something, whatever. There were Congo drums in the back. I'm like, yo, what? And you didn't know what was in the Congo drums. So I didn't even never knew what I was driving from before. And so that's why I never even had it on my conscience. Right. And I I didn't ask neither, nor did I look in the back. You didn't want it on your conscience. At all. The whole time I'm like, what's in those Congo drums? What's in those Congo drums? What's in those Congo drums? And this nasty feeling starts bubbling up. Weird stuff starts happening. And I, it was just, everything about it was weird. I get to the stop. The one time they tell me to get out, x-ray my car. Soon as they, soon as they x-ray, that, well, they didn't x-ray the car, but they, they x-rayed the, they took out the Congo drums. They said, oh, it's my friend's car, yada, yada, yada. They x-ray, they put the Congo drums in the x-rays and I seen these little, the shadow of these like little things and I'm just like, my life is over. And it just, everything just sunk. My whole entire, it was like my knees were weak. I didn't know what this, because I didn't know what it was. Bro, they went to go open up the Congo drums and it was empty. And I was like, Maybe this is my chance. I'm like, and they couldn't even understand. They're like, how, how is this possible? They took an ax, open up the lining mm. of the Congo drums. And in there were these little yellow bricks. And I was like, my life is over. And I didn't know. I, I had no idea what it was. And then they put me in cuffs. And they took me to the interrogation place. And I'm just like, Doc, what did you, what did you do? What, Garen, what did you do? Like, how did you get yourself into this? You had so much stuff going on for you. And that's the only time I actually regretted. And I was like, damn. In the interrogation room, after they gave me like a little corner slice of bread every day, I didn't get to brush my teeth. I didn't get to take a shower. And they were trying to force me to to uh to admit of who it was. Yeah. Nah. nah, bro. I love my family too much and I love my life too much. So I was just like, they showed me video of me on on camera. And I said, that's not me, and I don't know who that is. Video of you, like, at the stop? Surveillance video of me hanging out with the people. Oh, wow. So they were on you for a while. They were on them for a while. Oh, okay. And I just happened to be associated. Mm. So they showed me video of me hanging out with them. And I was like, that ain't me. I'm looking at me saying, that ain't me. And then... Finally, they take me to a prison. And what before they take me to a prison, I make, I make front page of the, the newspaper as a member of the American Connection. Wow. It was like, and it was, but then once I found, like they, they, they went through all of the stuff and it ended up being 6.2 kilos of heroin. Mm. And I was like, yo. I've never had a sip of alcohol in my life. Smoke weed one time in what? 11th grade. Don't do drugs. And I'm, I just got busted for drugs. And I'm like, my life is over. Literally. That's what I said. My life is over. 6.2 kilos of heroin. Front page of the newspaper. And then all of a sudden I found out, that the car I was in was a stolen luxury vehicle. Oh my gosh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so it it start trailing. I start, and then all of a sudden it was connected to the mafia. Oh, it was it was deep trails. It was deep. Like I thought it was just like from here to here. Nah, it was way. I was like, wait, hold on. 
I don't know nothing about any of this stuff. The one thing that saved me is the paper that was inside of the, of the, um, cause see, they try to pin the whole thing on me at all the stuff. Yeah. The paper that was inside the Congo drums. Cause see, they had my whole flight itinerary was from a different, was from a date where I already had, I had proof that I was in America. Mm. So it had to have been somebody else that had done that, but they were trying to say that I did this whole thing. And I was just like, it wasn't me, wasn't me, wasn't me, wasn't me, wasn't me. And then I ended up going to prison, spending the next, I was in there for a whole entire year before I even got sentenced. And, you know, you get, wow. yeah, no, it was crazy. And, and here's the thing. In America, you get your first phone call the night of. My first phone call was after one year. What? One year. So what was all your friends and family thinking? Some people thought I died. It took, uh, it took about a month for my mom to find out. And how did she find out? Because they were processing all this by the consulate. They were processing all this paperwork and everything. And, um, and it took about... It took about a month and my mom was just so worried because it like the consulate had to come in first. Then they had to contact my mom and any letter that I wrote, I'd write a letter. They have to screen it. Then they have to decode my letter. And then it goes, it would take two months to get to America oh my gosh. and two months to come back. I wrote over a hundred letters to friends and only five people wrote me back. And that, yeah, that's when I learned nobody's going to save me. I got to save myself. And those five people, I assume, are still in your life today. Yeah, it's my, my daughter's mother, Laura, um, my boy Troy, my brother, um, uh, my mom, um, and just a few members of my family. Yeah, I guess going to jail really shows you who your real friends are. Oh, and, and a friend of mine, uh, Lexi. Yeah, no, nah, it was crazy. Like everyone, no one wrote me back. And I was like, all right, I see what it is, but I have to keep my mind occupied. And that's when I start reading and reading and reading and reading. And then I got that book, the power of positive thinking. So I got the book, the power of positive thinking and I'm reading and reading and over and over and over and over and over. I get sentenced. They sentenced me till 2014, and that was back in 2002. Mm -hmm. I mean, 2003. So they gave me a 12-year sentence. So in my head, I'm not getting out. My life is over. My daughter was a year at the time. I'm not going to see her wow. until she's grown. My business manager at the time stole all my money, and my one piece of pride was I could still pay child support while I was in prison, and she stole all my money. And I, I it, it bro, it was crazy. It was so difficult. And my thing was, how can I occupy my mind? I've got to occupy my mind. And the best thing to do is read, memorize my dreams. And as I started doing the reading, the power of positive thinking again, remember I read power of positive thinking before, right? Then I stopped reading power of positive thinking. Then all this weird stuff happens, but I'm not aware. Then I start reading the power of positive thinking again. Mind you, I'm not planning on getting out. When I read that, read that book, and it talks a lot of, this is like a biblical principles, forgiveness, um, you know, letting go of your pride and ego, being nice to people, being generous and things like that, praying every night. Um, I really wasn't aware of exactly what I was reading, but it seems like every time I read that book is like my brain would just be more peaceful and calm. And then I remembered that I love to run. I remembered that I love, um, uh, art painting. I remembered that I love singing. So an inmate goes, he goes, he's in another cell. Every time you sing, it makes me feel free. So I just start singing to bring joy to somebody else, but it made me feel better. And I would draw other people's portraits of their family. They were crying. They were like, do you want anything? I'm like, nah, cause I get such 
joy from taking something that I love and giving it away to people and bringing joy to their lives. Then they have this thing called promenade. That's where you walk around in the circle. In America, they call it the yard. Mm. There's stabbings, fightings, drug deals happen all the time. And I have this little voice that says, run. You love to run. Nobody's running. So one day, I just start to, I decided to run because I love to run. Then all of a sudden, within a month, damn near at 90% of the people were running with me. Wow, just in a circle in the, in the courtyard? For an entire hour. It's one hour in the morning, two hours in the afternoon. Boom, for an entire hour. Everybody was getting all fit and stuff. It was crazy. And I didn't realize what was happening. Then the... The um the sergeant guy brought me to the office. He said, "Thank you for what." You, of course, it was in like French, cause I I could I could speak damn near fluent French. Mm. Um, um. So the sergeant guy brought me in and said, "Not sergeant, but the they call him the sauvignon. I don't know what that the equivalent that is. The main person <laughs> said, "Thank you, because ever since you've been running, there's been less fights, less drug deals, less stabbings." And interestingly enough, I was watching uh, Shawshank Redemption and Tim Robbins is a movie that's based on prison. So it was like real life. I one of the best. He said they can take everything they want away from me, but they can't take away from my mind. They can't take away my mind. And then something hit me. Well, as long as I'm doing everything I love, then I'll be free. Oh, I knew in that moment why I was in prison because when I was out free quote unquote, I felt like I, I I said, I feel like I'm so far away from where I'm supposed to be. I feel like I'm in prison inside of my own body. I used to say that every day. And guess what? I manifested being Mm -hmm. in a whole nother country in prison. So when I was in there and I was like, you know what? Your physical space does not determine your mental space. So just because I'm in the physical space called prison doesn't mean that I can't be free in my mind. In that moment, I said, well, then I'm free because I'm doing everything that I love. I'm dancing. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm singing. I'm doing my art. I'm running. I'm being active. When I run, I always feel free. Every time. I don't run for exercise. I run because it's like a spiritual awakening for me. Right. And it just happens to be exercise. But I was, and so when I started saying, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free, I'm a free man, because I'm doing everything that I love. I didn't do that out there. Doing everything that I love. When I became the characteristics of the embodiment of a free man, Jones, you're getting out next week. Yeah, so that's one of the craziest parts about your story, because you said... After you were in there for about two years, correct? Two and a half years. Two and a half years. Yeah. And then they went and tested the heroin. So I don't even know why they retested the drugs. So they had already tested it three times, 6.2 kilos of heroin every time. And then all of a sudden, I start acting free, loving my life, regardless for everyone out there, loving my life regardless of my current circumstance, regardless, and doing, doing everything that bring, sparks joy to my life and bringing joy to other people. When I became the essence of freedom, out of nowhere, they retested the drugs and said, Jones, you're free to go home. The drugs were fake and not 100%. It was like for the amount that was in there, you've already done the time. Wow. Okay. Everything else is fake. You're free to go. Wow. Now, if you ask me, connecting the dots, looking backwards, when I, you think about how a woman gives birth, woman gives birth, seed is that she's impregnated. Then all of a sudden, the baby grows inside of the womb. When the baby get be, gets too big for the womb, what once grew on the inside is now produced in the next realm, is now produced outside. That's its next level. Boom. 
I feel that I was, because I was seeing myself as free and loving myself and bringing joy to other people, that my container for value started filling up and filling up and filling up and filling up. And then it started to overflow into the next container. Well, if I took a cup right now and then I poured water in it and it overflowed, then it would overflow into your room. But if I kept pouring, it would overflow the room because it's too big for the space. And then it would go into the next room. Boom. So my container of value, I poured into myself. It overflowed into the prison. I strongly feel connecting the dots, looking backwards that the value was too big for prison. And what once grew on the inside, like the baby, was now the free man, Garen, produced in the next realm called freedom. Because that was who I was being. That's all done so through a change in your mindset. Absolutely. And I wasn't aware at this time. Yes. Okay, so you, you get out of the prison. I get out, I get out of prison. I'm high on life, but I'm high on momentum of what I, of how I'm living my life. Next thing you know, I'm, uh, you know, I have a, I have a play brother named D Ray Davis. He was like, you want to stay at my house? And I was like, I was like, yeah, he was like, well, man, I'll drive you anywhere. Pay for your food. Cause I didn't have no money. Pay for your food, everything. You want to be a singer, right? I'm like, yeah, don't come home unless you have a song. That was his way of, but what that activated inside of me was the same person who my mom says, You're, you, can't, you can buy whatever you want if you can make your own money. So when he said, don't come home unless you have a song, that little thing came up again. Ugh. 30 days, I had 28 songs. Oh my gosh. I didn't know any producers, but guess what? I had a MySpace and I went on MySpace and I messaged a thousand people who would do that. Most people not. This is what I'm saying. (laughs) And just like I went through all of those, uh, um, um, what is it called? The rejections to get to my powerful yes and modeling. I was just messaging people. Nobody was messaging me. And this was before, um, you know, MySpace, they would tap people for spamming and things like that. I would just send the same message. Finally, a guy named John Henry messages me back. I go to his studio. We record one song. I put the one song on my MySpace page. And then next thing you know, that is what got me in the door to all to, to everything else. 30 days. I had 28 songs. And then at, and at the end of 30 days, I went to uh, the, the comedy, sh- uh, comedy store improv in, in Los Angeles where my brother was hosting. Ludacris just happened to be there. I gave him my demo And 30 days later, I had a $500,000 record deal. Unbelievable. And this is like less than two months after the prison? This is in uh, 2007. No, 2006. Yeah, it was a few months after prison. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So your life, I mean, like I said, the beginning is going like this. Up and and down, up and down. So then you get into the music industry. Yep. And you're you're are you loving it at this point so in the beginning i was loving it because i was you know what was told to me was like we're not going to change anything we love everything about you um you know i had this organic fan base i was like the top of like myspace charts and things like that getting features and everything and all of a sudden i find myself on stage with gangster rappers but my music wasn't like that. It was like happy go lucky pop alternative R and B music. And I have no issue with that. However, it it wasn't conducive to like how the how it should have been branded. And then all of a sudden I'm making different kinds of oh, you should make this music like this. And I didn't fight for my own authenticity. And what I said was, yes. Okay, yes, I'll do this. I'll make this music like this. I'll make this music like this. And so I started doing everything else for everyone else. When I was writing songs, I was trying to become them and write them songs. And I was doing all this stuff. 
And I left me in the process. When I left me in the process, it was done. And so when I was in music, I ended up leaving the label because I just didn't, I was just like, people are, are you crazy? You're signing ludicrous. I'm like, no, listen, there's no amount of money you can pay me. If I don't feel it, I'm out. So how were you able to get out of your contract that easy? Because I hear like music contracts can be just like basically like a life sentence and they got you. No, nah, it was a, it was a, it was a, I, f- I forgot what it's called. It's like a Nolan Void type deal because they got to keep the rights of the songs and things like that. And I was like, keep every song. Like, pff. did they give you all the money uh, at the they, beginning? No, nah, no, nah. I got, I got a, 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 a small up front, up front bonus. But the money would have came if I would have put out the album. So I never put out the album. I see. So I never put out the album. And then, yo, it, it, bro, it was crazy. And then I ended up leaving. I was like, I'll do it by myself. And then all of a sudden I just started, I wasn't making any money. No money was coming in. And so everybody seen me on, you know, the the, the song Celebrity Chick with Chingy and Luda. And, and I'm, you know, I'm just with Jordan Sparks and, and they seen me every place. It's like, man, I'm trying to get like you. And I, and then meanwhile, I'm dying on the inside and I'm playing face to make it look like it was good, but it wasn't, it was an image that I was trying to keep up that I couldn't keep up. Cause I was dying on the inside. No money. My daughter had, it, it, I, I didn't do my part as a father and rightfully so. She didn't want me in her life. My girlfriend had just broke up with me. My mom was dying in the hospital. I'm $200,000 in debt, not including the money I owed some other off the record people. Wow. I'm living in my car because that's the only thing that I had. And my final straw is, and this is while I was living in my car because they couldn't take my car away from me. I'm in the studio. I'm not going to name the name. What a major recording artist, Platinum. I come up with the, the, the concept, come up with the melody, and I write half the song. All of a sudden, I'm not wel- welcome back to the studio. And then when we start talking about points and royalty points and things like that, they said, no, they changed the song. They changed, they changed that part. So it's a completely new song. Song comes out. It has one of my favorite artists featured on there. Song goes number one. Song wins a Grammy. Oh, what? And I get no credit. And his friend that wasn't even there got credit on that song. So all they did was change the words. They kept the no, same. No, they didn't change the words. Nothing was changed. It was a lie. So they just told you. They just told me that so they could F me out of this money, out of this, out of this, out of these points. Okay. That, I mean. That must have been. And I didn't, I didn't have any backing. I didn't, you know, it was just like, I didn't really have any backing. Right. Their words against yours. And it was like a major, major, major multi-platinum selling artist. And I was just like, you know what? F the industry, F music, F all these people. I know God put me on this earth to be great. There's got to be something. There's got to be something. And that's when I just completely closed myself to the world. I was like, that was, that was a wrap. And somebody's like, Oh, you just gotta go. You ha- you, you gotta, this is what you gotta go through to make it. No, nah, no, nah, fuck that. Nah, no, no. And I left the industry and, and everything in it. What I didn't know at the time is I also left a, a lot of beautiful relationships that I'm just now rekindling, but I didn't realize I did that. Cause I was just, I associated everybody with that one person. Yeah. Yeah, bro. I hear the music industry can just be one of the most vicious stab in the back industries in the entire world. You know, what? it's not the music industry. It's the people, the people, the, a lot of, there's a lot of people in, well, this was back in 2006. It's different now. Cause a lot of artists have a lot of freedom mm-hmm. uh, cause of social media and streams and things like that. A lot of people in 2006 that had, that were in positions of power, should not have been in positions of power. They abused it, um, took advantage of people. All you got to do is look at your favorite artist. When they're happy, when they first get their deal and things are going great, 
look at them five years later. Just look at their countenance. Look mm-hmm. at their spirit, their soul. There's something happening. And I couldn't see it till I left. And then when I left the industry and I went to this, it was like a Labor Day party. There's nothing but music people there. People were like, how did you get out? Almost like they were stuck in. Yep. But by that time I was getting healthy and I was helping people through health and fitness and I was loving myself and I started doing personal development and everything. Um, oh, let, back, let me back, let me back pedal. So my final straw was me on the corner of uh, Hollywood and La Brea at 343 in the morning. It was uh, August 2011. And you know, there's a time in your life when you, you get to the point where it's like, can it get any worse? And then bad stuff just starts happening because you keep asking. I wasn't aware of how the mind, I mean, all these good things would happen because of my mind and what I was feeding my brain, but I wasn't aware of it. And you can't change what you're not aware of. And so I got to the point where, can it get any worse? I needed to start asking a different question. And I'm sitting in the parking lot of, of um, it's a place called Mail and More in Hollywood, La Brea, La Brea and Hollywood Boulevard. And I just reach my breaking point and I just start crying. Okay, I'm tired of fighting. I don't want to fight anymore. I want to be healthy. I want to be happy. I want to be surrounded by nothing but positive people. And I want to make a bunch of money, but I want the money to represent something that I passionately believe in that I would do for free. Just show me a sign. I'm going to say that again. I want to make a bunch of money doing something that I passionately believe in that I would do for free. Just show me a sign. And what ignited this feeling in you? I, I was about to kill myself. Well, wasn't it your car got impounded? Well, the, the my car got impounded, but that was part of the can it get any worse. So car got impounded, got 14 traffic tickets, boot on the car. At, then my mom gives me the money for me to get the boot off. Then it gets impounded. Then I get it back out again. Then all of a sudden I get to, um, I take, somebody sends me this random $1,400 in PayPal and says, I believe in you. Keep going. What? Anonymous. Completely anonymous. Anonymous. Still to this day, you have no idea. Keep going. I believe in you. Keep going. All of a sudden, it was the exact amount of money I needed to get my license unsuspended, my registration fee paid, and all my 14 parking tickets paid for. So I drive downtown to get them paid for one block before I got to the courthouse, a cop pulls me over and he says, going to have to take your car. And I'm like, I'm one block. I'm going, I'm going to pay the parking tickets right now. I look, I have the money right now. It's right here. And the cop takes my car. And I was like, I'm homeless. Like I, this, I live in my car. I got three white trash bags full of clothes. They're my clothes. And leaves me in a Denny's parking lot. And that was that. Was that. He like called the tow truck? The tow truck came and took my car. One block away. One block away from me going to pay for it. So I go there with my three white trash bags. I go and pay. And I pay registration, pay the par- uh, the the parking tickets, pay a back fee for child support, get the suspension uh, re- uh, released. My mom gives me money um, via, I forgot how she sent it, but she sent the money to get the money out. I mean, to get my car out. I get my car Day I get my car back, very next day, somebody breaks into my car, steals what was like my computer and all this. I was like, man, I cannot win. I can't win. Like, why does all this stuff keep happening to me? That's when I had my breaking point. 
So August 2011, 343, window busted out. It's raining. I have a white t-shirt scotch taped to the window. That's when I was like, that, okay, I'm tired of fighting. I don't want to fight anymore. I want to be healthy. I want to be happy. I want to be surrounded by nothing but positive people. And I just want to make a bunch of money, but I want the money to represent something that I passionately believe in. Just show me a sign. That was my breaking point. A week later, I'm at the gas station and a homeless guy walks up to me asking me for money. He has a wad of money. I say, you have more money than me. And he said, change your mindset, change your life. I've heard many years people say things I never listen. But it was something about what he said and the way that he said it that caused a conscious interrupt and made me think about my whole life. And I've at that moment, I felt like my whole life was a lie because of the thoughts that I was telling myself. He said, change your mindset, change your life. And from that moment, I was like, change your mindset, change your life, change your mind. So if my mind is set on something, and that's why the result is what it is. So if I do different with the same circumstance, my life will change. It's been eight years. And that one philosophy, every time I don't feel like doing something, change your mindset, change your life. I just do it. But I started with, normally I don't take the escalator. Normally I take the escalator. Normally I take the escalator. Change your mindset, change your life. So I'm going to take the stairs. Normally I use gel soap. Change your mindset, change your life. So I'm going to use bar soap. Normally I, and then I just kept doing that. But an object in motion stays in motion. So I started building a new neuro pathway and giving it energy, when you give it energy, it's like a car driving down a freeway with no traffic. So that became my new wave. So I've staged myself. I'm eight years removed of the habitual pattern of the downward spiral my life was going. But it wasn't until I went to a, a transformation workshop where a person says, when you read the book, never put the book down. You keep reading the book or else the weeds of your past are going to creep back. Mm. I'm like, oh, that's why all this crazy stuff, all these amazing things happen. That was when I was reading the book, The Power of Positive Thinking. Positive thinking, yep. meaning something to do with my brain and my thoughts, which is connected to my heart. When I stopped reading the book, the weeds of my past, ego set in, pride set in, resentment set in. And so past like things start to manifest into my life. Weeds don't need nothing to grow, but time. So if you give it time, it will overtake the garden. That's why the gardeners are always mulching the grass mm -hmm. and doing it. That They're like tending the garden. You tend your garden by constantly renewing your mind, constantly reading, constantly growing. You brush your teeth every day. Okay. You're constantly brushing your teeth. That's why your breath is fresh. But if you stopped after brushing your teeth for a year, for a whole week, you can't, you know, why is my breath stink? No, that, because the whole deal is for you to brush your teeth every day. You take a shower every day. You eat every day so that you can replenish your, your body and build strength. Okay, cool. You renew your mind every day. If you don't renew your mind, well, so that's why the up and down and up and down and up and down happen so drastically and so, on so on com two completely different spectrums is because life was not happening to me. It was responding to me. Mm -hmm. Wow. And you even took the change your mindset, change your life to you were even writing with your left hand. You switch your yeah. type of soaps. The first time I tried that, I remember we had that conversation. I went home and I remember you're like, I used to take the escalator. I'm going to take the stairs. So me and my friends were on the sixth floor of a parking structure um, and there was an elevator right there. I'm like, you know what? Let's take the stairs. Mm -hmm. Get to the bottom of the stairs. Elevator was broken the whole time. Wow. When we were in Vegas two nights ago, I was telling Mikey that you're going to be on the podcast. Yeah. And he's like, look, everyone's taking the escalators. 
there's stairs in the middle. Like when you cross over in Vegas, yeah, the stairs. Let's take stairs every time. We took the stairs every single time, and nobody was doing that. Yeah, we, we felt great. We were feeling yeah. amazing. No, nah, there, there's something that it it what it does is it um, activates your um, your ability to adapt. So from the ages zero to seven is where kids grow the most. From ages seven to nine it drops some some crazy number i'm paraphrasing but it drops like 50 60 percent in learning ability Mm. because then you start to carry on the same pattern Mm -hmm. that's why people typically date the same kind of people or or they have the same kind of money issues is because they're carrying a pattern of something that they learned when they were a child the reason why i say that is when you break the pattern That's where breakthroughs actually come. That's the whole concept of change your mindset, change your life. If I'm going left all the time and I keep eating, getting chased by a tiger, well, if you go down right, that lessens your ability. I mean, that lessens the the possibility of the same thing keep happening. You'll You'll end up in a new route. So that whole concept... When I started, stopped using my right hand and I started using my left hand, it activated like my a different part of my brain. I started being really creative and everything. So as I'm using my left hand, I'm activating the muscle to learn how to adapt again. So when I, even when I was in prison, I was using my left hand. I learned a new language. I was doing all these new things. Well, when you become a new person, you will produce a new result. Wow. Yeah. See, this is why I love talking with you. It's like there's, I don't take anything you say for granted at all. I make sure I I sit there and understand exactly what you're saying. Yeah. And so you found this, which, how crazy is it that eight years later, what that man told you at the gas station is now the title of your first book. And the name of my company. And when you get a check, it's written on my checks. And so I just felt like that was an angel that God will use anybody, anybody, if you have the, there's two sets of sights, eyes on the outside and eyes on the inside, the insight. You have the insight to be able to see it and experience it and feel it. Okay. So when you discovered this whole new shift mm-hmm. and you went to the transformation seminar, now you got to change your mindset, change your life in your head. Mm-hmm. How did it change your life? Well, it was a, it was a gradual process. So if you do the same thing all the time, my dad had always said, he's like, um, if you if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you always got. Ooh. So my dad said, and so if you do something different, it's going to produce a different result. It it just is because you're just approaching life completely differently. Everything, every everything different that you do is creating some kind of different somewhere in your life. So if you woke up, Every day you sleep the same way, you lay the same way, you eat food the same way. <clears throat> Imagine how your life, if for 30 days you stopped using your non-dominant hand, I mean your, your dominant, you stopped using your dominant hand and then you use your non-dominant hand and then close your eyes while you're eating your food and then sleep on the opposite side of the bed mm. and then wake up an hour earlier and then everything that you do you're just always using your left hand brushing your teeth eating all these different things watch what happens in 30 days in 30 days yeah it's crazy so what happened to you in those 30 days? Well, you said it was a gradual process, Yeah, it was a gradual process. Well, the thing about it is it's not a thing that's like ta-da like do you remember the time where you exactly the time where you were learning ABCs, 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 ball, then cat, and then dog, then sentence. And then it's a gradual process when you are just continuously um, working on the basics. There's always an expanded something that happens, you know, when you're constantly Um, if you run one mile and then you run one mile and it's really difficult and you keep running one mile and you want, and then all of a sudden it gets easier, 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 easier. 
the process is now, guess what? You can now run five miles because you now one mile is so simple. You can run it in six minutes. Now you have what you've built is a bigger capacity to now do even more. So there's a natural process that happens that you cannot just say because it's, it's how do we learn language? It's like if something happens and it just happens or balance, you can study a book on balance, but it's not going to happen until you get on the bike, fall down, get up, fall down. Then all of a sudden, bam, the click ha- happens. So there is a natural process of evolution when we take on new things. New solves all. That's why no one mm. listening right now has an iPhone 1 as their main source of communication. Not one person. Why? Because the evolution, and you don't really remember, it's just this evolution of nature that is just going like this. Thing about it is, I had a vision for my life, and we have a vision for your life, that's the direction you're going to flow in once you start taking on new things. Even if the new thing has nothing to do with the, with the, uh, with the direction that, that you're going in. I was doing music. I was learning how to do vocals and things like that. And then I got into health and wellness and I learned how to do recognition. But I was like, wait a second. The skills I learned here transferred to here and I can do this. And then all of a sudden I find myself on stage in front of 20,000 people. They're like, yo, how can you control the crowd like that? I used to be a singer. Mm. And it just all translated, but I couldn't see. All I knew is I'm supposed to be on TV. I know I'm supposed to be um, uh, uh, inspiring millions of people. I already knew. I already always knew, but I just didn't know how. I didn't know which platform or medium. And um, so when it comes to change, you've got to first want it. And then when you want it, now... You've got to know what to look for. You look for things that's going to constantly stretch you, constantly grow you so you're not inside of your comfort zone. And it's easy to stay inside of your comfort zone. You can be like, oh, you know, it, my life is good. And I look around me. And if the people around me aren't doing as good as me, I'm going to stay right here because I'm doing better than the people around me. Oh, no. The top of one hill is the bottom of the next. Mm. So, okay, where's your new group? I just, I went through three years in the last three years where I was just like, I'm doing great. I'm part of the, the two comma club. You know, the two comma club is, well, I'm assuming, you know, a millionaire. Yeah. 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 (laughs) So I'm part of the two comma club and, and I'm doing great. I'm, you know, happy and all this other stuff. And all of a sudden I'm just like, And I'm just kind of getting bored. And and I was like, wait a second. I need a new group. So I started praying. I was like, yo, I need to meet new people. Somebody who's going to challenge me like crazy. I want to be around. I want to be the small fish in the room. I want to be the person where, you know, my just under, it's like ju- just under, um, Right, right below eight figures a year as far as net profit. You know, I, I, I want, I want that to be the smallest in the room. Yeah. And I'm paraphrasing, and I'm saying it monetary wise, but then I didn't, I didn't really know what I was saying. But I was just like, I want to feel like I just, I really don't, I, I, I feel small. So I've got to grow. I've got to stretch. What are they saying? What are they doing? Boom. So I went to go seek all of that. And that's how I ended up at the mastermind. And Mm -hmm. that's how I met you. And I started meeting all these people. And then all of a sudden, I meet a woman. And we are so much alike. And we are so different. And guess what? There's sometimes when she is in her strength zone, I feel really small. And I was like, wait a second. There is no better way to grow than with your with your with your with your soulmate. And I attracted exactly what I wanted. Because my my wife, uh, Blair, she is 
if not as powerful, more powerful than I am. She just hasn't had the platforms that I've had. Mm-hmm. But when you hear her story and the way in which she can, and, and I'm just like, sometimes I watch her and I forget we're married. I'm like, yo, I'm such a fan. And, and, but there's some, when she gets into her mode, I'm just like, yo, I feel really small. I was like, wait a second. I asked for this. I asked for someone that can challenge me like in, in ways that I've never been challenged. And that's exactly what my, my amazing uh, marriage is like. And we challenge each other because I am also that for her in my areas of strength. I just remember I saw you two together once and it was like, I, it was pure love. It kind of reminded me of like two kids who are yeah. just madly, madly, madly in love with yeah. each other. It was yeah. just an incredible sight to see. Yeah. So in the past decade, you yeah. went from hundreds of thousands in debt to the yeah. two, tom, two comma club. Yeah. And within there, you've spoken in, how many countries did you speak? So now in the last uh, five years, it's been 63 countries. <sighs> 63 countries. Yeah. So now what would you define as what you are today? What, uh, can you speak more into that? If someone came up to you and said, oh, nice to meet you. What do you do for a living? What would you tell them? You know, it, defi- it keeps on defining itself because I keep on being open to all these new things. Let me tell you something. Now I'm an author. I'm a dad. You know, I have an amazing daughter that's going in her second semester at NYU right now. Um, so I'm a father, I'm an author, um, freaking, I'm a transformation coach. I do three day transformation. I I do workshops. I speak like I have my children's foundation. I mean, my youth foundation, there's so many different things. I'm a man of the people, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the kind of person who wants people wants to see people win at life with the gifts that I know God has given them so they can pr- produce extraordinary results in their life. So I'm in the process of defining it again because I've had to define it several times over the last eight years. Now I just put a book out. So I'm an author, baby. Yep. You know what I'm saying? A very successful one at that. Thank you so much. In two days. Yeah, two days is pretty cool. I was like, wait, whoa, I didn't. I didn't think about how royalties work because I, <laughs> I, I didn't even want to have a book. I didn't want to make a book to make money. I don't because I bet money's coming in from all these other places. Right. I didn't want to make a book. So I didn't even think it was the last thing in my mind of the royalties of, of a book. Mm-hmm. I just want people to have a message, you know, and I want people to have a simple message. I read a lot of because of all of the work that I done. There's a lot of really good self-help books that, but you have to be on that level to like really read it and understand it. My book is really simple. Mm -hmm. It's simple to read and they have simple exercises. And so if it's somebody that's been in the work and it's crazy, they might read the book and be like, you know, it was just a lot of simple stuff. Yeah. I'm I'm actually trying to reach the masses the masses of people. Yes. Because you got to meet, you, you don't put a baby in pre-calculus. You got to meet them where they are. Then you graduate them up. And so I wanted to have something that was really simple. Um, however, if you truly grasp the book and the message, it'd be something for everybody. And it would build that great foundation, which gets me into the two most powerful things that you've ever told me. Yeah. The first one was when we were talking about uh, basically upgrading yourself. Yeah. And you said, you know, what iPhone do you have? I go, iPhone 10. And he goes, does that have an aux port? I go, no. But does it have something? And he said, does it have something new? And I go, well, they added a second camera. Mm-hmm. And you go, in, the, in life, in order for you to upgrade yourself, sometimes you got to remove certain things to make room for the upgrades. Yeah, and absolutely. I, I think about that weekly. But what I think about daily is when we talked about foundation and you said you had the root canal about 19 19 years ago. Yeah. And all of a sudden your jaw swelled up and you look like uh, Thanos. Thanos. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And, and you said that's impossible when you went to the dentist Uh, that was removed 19 years ago. And she said, well, they never got the full root. We got to go back. Yeah. yeah, They never got it to the root. So whatever. So 
basically what he was saying was, uh, you know, I had, my jaw was like that big. Go to the dentist. They said, well, you got to get a root canal. I'm like, I already had a root canal there. They was like, well, whoever originally did it never got it to the root. So you've got 19 years worth of infection that just showed up on the surface. That, I thought about every relationship I ever had, singing group that broke up, every job I ever got fired from, and relationships that other people been in that they know at the root they didn't want to be in, but they stayed in the relationship. And mm -hmm. then five years later, he cheated, she cheated, he beat her, she beat him, some craziness. But it was all be because at the foundation, one of them did not want to be there. So the universe is giving you a sign to leave, get out. So for me... When that happened, it gave me this epiphany about life. I'm like, you know what? If I want to find out and how to get rid of something, how to clear something, how to heal something, it will never happen from the surface. You cannot pull a weed from the surface. You actually got to pull it from the root to remove it. And then it'll be, you can fill it with like new mulch, new grass and whatever. But everything, all my relationships were being manifested by my very first relationship mm. with my mom. Yes. You know, that's why a lot of times women, they date men who have characteristics of their dad. Yeah. They had a horrible relationship with their dad, or if they had a really good relationship with their dad, all of a sudden they keep dating their dad in many different forms until that is, that's healed or acknowledged. Mm -hmm. But, but, because that's your, your first mentors and you know, whatever my relationship was, was with my dad, my relationship was with, um, with my mom gave me the foundation. That was the foundation, but it was broken. I had a broken family. And so naturally if I try to create family, it's going to keep breaking because wow. at the root of family, I, I haven't, it's built off the foundation of broke. So I healed my relationship with my dad, even though he was murdered when I was 12, I got alone in a quiet room and had a conversation with him, apologized for my part, not what he did, what I did, because I, I, I took full responsibility. I apologized to my mom and I said, just thank you for everything that you've ever done. And I, you know, I was really ungrateful and I said some things and I did some things and I thought some things without making her wrong. Because the freedom was about me and it wasn't about her. However, she needed to see an example of what freedom was like. So all the time when my mom would say thing, when, when she would make food and go to her room, I was eating dinner by myself, me and my brother, like all through middle school and high school. So I said, my mom doesn't love me. So when I went to go apologize to my mom four years ago, she was like, you know, baby, every time I went to the room, I would actually go and cry because I didn't think that you appreciated me cooking for you. Wow. And I was like, oh. wow. And in that moment, I removed mom from mom box and I introduced myself to Sherry Ann Jones, who just happens to be my mom. She removed son from son box and she introduced herself to Garen Jones, who just happens to be her son. And we formed a relationship there. And we've been inseparable ever since. And she's such an incredible woman. And when she does things that used to annoy me, I, know, I now know that that was her way of saying, I love you. When she, would, she was a valedictorian, so she'd correct me whenever I spelled things wrong on social media, which I was in special education classes, and I never even learned punctuation. And so now I used to get pissed off. Now I just say, I love you too, mom. Thank you. Cause that's the way she expresses love. And she only knows what she knows. Just like I only knew until I knew better. When I knew better, I could see the box that I was living in. Wow. So do you think you'd be able to have the relationship you now have with your wife, Blair, if you never had that conversation? Absolutely with not. Absolutely not. If I did not 
Because, see, I, I, I've always heard people say, leave the past in the past. And here's what I want to say to that. Not if you didn't get the lesson. Because if you don't get the lesson, you're going to have to pay for it for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. So because I went back, I realized people always said, there's gold at the end of the rainbow. The gold is at the beginning of the rainbow. Yeah. And so that gold is when I went back to my root, cleaned it up, but I cleaned up my part. It wasn't about how my mom was going to respond. It was, I said this, I thought this, and I just want to thank you for everything that you've done because you've done the best that you did with what you know. And I love you. And I want to create the possibility of us, you know, having a fun, loving, credible relationship. Yeah. So from space of nothing, you can create anything. Mm -hmm. So I created and verbalized it, the relationship I wanted, yes. which is the one that I now have. But I also have that with my wife. Truly incredible. Yeah. And a lot of people never, ever have that conversation. So a lot of people never have. Yeah, that but they don't teach you this in school. No. They don't teach you. They don't teach you none of this in school. You got to, you know, I, I heard this kind of stuff from people that are like 80, 90 years old because they know they're about to die. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yo, I don't wait. I don't want to wait until I'm about to die to start living. That's exactly what Gary Vee said. He oh, said really? He'd go to the homes all the time. And he said the most common thing that he's ever heard every single, almost every single time. I wish. I wish. Yeah. I wish. I wish. But I do want to let you know that that foundational thing you taught me. Yeah. I think that's hugely, hugely impactful. Even recently, I was thinking actually at the gym, we were talking yesterday like, you know, I've moved to L.A. four times. This is my fourth time. And okay. this time it's really working out. Yeah. The past three, it never did. Because, and this is now looking back on myself then, I can see it in a lot of other people who come to L.A. and yeah. who want to come to L.A. They think coming to L.A. is how they're going to become the person they want to be, how they're going to fix their problems, and it's all outward. It's all outward. It's somewhere in L.A. Yeah. I thought that the first three times. But between the third time and now, I realize it's inward. Yeah. Everything I've been looking for was inward. And if I don't have that foundational strength within, when I come to LA, even if I get something big, it's going to fall apart. That's why you see a lot of people start making 10 million a year, but they never had that foundation. They never had the chance to build that foundation. Yeah. And it crumbles just as fast as it went up. Now you see why I put out my book called Change Your Mindset, Change Your Life. Yep. That talks about Forgiveness, letting go of resentment, doing what you love, upgrading yourself continuously, creating the space to make room for your blessings, trusting the process, being healthy. It is a foundational book. So other people, if you don't understand how powerful a strong foundation can be, you're going to miss the message in this book. That's why it's so simple. Mm -hmm. If you'll miss the simple and go for the complex, your house is going to crumble. This is a very simple guide that if you, listen, the lessons and the stories are more powerful than the freaking action steps at the end. Pay attention to what I'm saying, how I'm saying, and the, what I changed inside of the stories. You're going to have something really, 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 really powerful for your life. And all this is, is something that you can build your life on the top of. Yes. Yep. So I want everyone to go to Amazon right now by change your mindset, change your life by Gary and Jones. Yes, sir. By 20 of them. Who cares? By 30 of them. There's a lady that I don't even know that bought 100. And I was just like, she was like, listen, I just buy these books and I, and I want to give them away to people. And that made sense because I buy power of positive thinking 50 at a time and I do that. And I think but it was almost like God uh, was saying, well, you have done it for the last eight years. I mean, six years. Now let me show you what that feels like. And how many times have you read 
power of positive thinking to now this it's day. uh 402 to 402 times between the paperback <laughs> and audiobook because i get something different every time Jeez, I, I talked to you like four months ago and yeah. you're at like 300 no 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 that was over the summer you're at 330 yeah so you're reading I it just about keep doing it over and over and over and over and over again and if it <laughs> here's what i want people to understand you don't learn something out there when you're reading, it reminds you of something that's already in here. Yes. It just reminds you of something. All I'm doing is reminding you of what your soul already knows. And if you can resonate with it, you spot it, you got it. I'm reminding you of who you are. Now, let me ask you this last question. Yes, sir. Will you ever be releasing an audio book for Ab- this? Absolutely. Oh, I can't wait for that. So I'm doing, um, you know, I'm doing, it's all self, uh, there's no money behind it i really wanted to put it in the hands of the people and it wanted to be a natural process it's number four in um new release uh new releases uh, on amazon for um for what is it called uh, tra- uh um self-development um i mean self-help transformation it is number 16 overall in self-help uh on the self-help list and it got up to 70 out of 33 million books on Amazon. Um, this book got up to 76 on the top 100. And it's all the people. The people, listen, the people will always speak. And my strength isn't in, in out of the gate speed. My strength is endurance over a long period of time. The foundation. Absolutely. And not one dollar in ads, nothing. No dollar in ads, um, there's no money. The, the, the only money that was behind this is for an editor. Mm. That's it. And everything that's happening is it's a blessing. It's a blessing in itself. And the people that are reaching out to me, the podcast, the TV shows, the news stations, the people that want me to come on. There's the, at my PR is, is the people I'm for the people. So the people are going to, take this wherever it wants to go and I will show up. Can we expect more books from Gary and Jones? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Especially when people, when I just seen these numbers after two days, I was just like, dang, people really want this thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, cool. Take it. That means, you know, the, 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 the people want it, they'll get it. And I'll keep on providing what the people want, especially when I, when I, when I have something to share. Well, Gary, I'm super happy for you. I'm super happy everything's going so well. Where can they find you on the socials? So you can go to my website, garenjones.com. Um, you can go to my Instagram. So I have two Instagrams and there's a reason why. Um, so I have my old Instagram, which was like everything is on there. And now I have my author Hell yeah. Instagram, which is the garen jones i just started it so there's like 200 followers like 160 on the other one however it just it's it's so cluttered with everything this one is specifically about book everything and transformation everything so i would add both of them which is garen.jones and the garen jones awesome i'm gonna go ahead and leave you guys those links below the link for the book will be below as well Garen, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me, brother. Absolutely. Yes, sir.